Many of you who have seen this program know that it's supposed to be a comedy. We do different things to get laughs from the audience. But on tonight's show, I'm asking for your patience as I take things in a different direction. I'm going to talk about my father, David Shea. He died a month and a day short of what would have been his 72nd birthday. In the year that has gone by since he passed, I've come to realize what I most associate him with. Drinking coffee, watching baseball, and eating big meaty sandwiches. When you notice when you are thinking about someone you've lost, you see the pattern. Coffee, baseball, big meat sandwiches. Now there's a sandwich shop near the studio here, and my father never went there, but their most famous sandwich is this pork sandwich with the french fries right in the meat. My father would have gone for that. I also know that my father would not have liked all this fuss being made about him. He wouldn't have liked me doing a show like this. When he retired from a long career working for the same public school system, he declined the usual honor of a big dinner with speeches. I mean, he had his reasons, I'm sure. But that's an example of how part of him was always hard to know. Well, we can start with the facts the way they do in the newspapers. David Shea was born on June 26, 1937, in Waterbury, Connecticut. He was the youngest of the late William and Geraldine Shea's eight children. After graduating from Hill House High School in New Haven, he served for two years in the U.S. Navy, mostly as a radio technician on aircraft carriers. He earned education degrees at New Haven Teachers College, St. Joseph's in Hartford, and the University of Bridgeport. His career of 33 years in the West Haven Public Schools included serving as principal of both West Haven High and Bailey Middle School. Following his retirement in 1994, he worked as a software consultant for Pearson SMS. David's lifelong passion after his family and work education was the Boston Red Sox. He is survived by his wife of 50 years, Judith M. Shea of Brantford, Connecticut. He leaves behind five children, three daughters-in-law, one son-in-law, and ten grandchildren. He was preceded in death by his son, Christopher Shea. Those are the facts. Uh, they help you recognize my father if he was one of the thousands of students and teachers whose lives he touched in some way. But those facts are not much help in knowing him. Well, if you only know one thing about my father, maybe it should be this. He passed the toughest test in life for some of us. He was loved by his mother-in-law. She would always talk about how wonderful he was. And if you knew her, if you knew my grandmother, you would realize that it wasn't easy to meet her high standards. But my father did. One time, after my parents had been out on a few dates, my mother got a call from another boy in high school, inviting her out. My grandmother told my mother flat out, Judy, call him back and say no. You're going out with Dave. He is such a nice boy. It wouldn't be fair to him. And my father was loved by his mother, who had eight children. I remember asking my grandmother, what was it like to have eight children? And she told me that every time she had a new child, she was afraid she would run out of love. But she told me that you never run out of love, no matter how many children you have. My father was David, my grandmother's youngest child. Now, he was Dave to the world but he was David to his parents and his siblings. And when he became a grandfather for the first time, he was only 52 years old, and he said he wanted to be called Dave by the grandkids, not Grandpa. I think he was defining his relationship with the grandkids. He wanted to run around with them in the yard and play games. He wanted to be the fun Grandpa, so why not call him Dave? And then we all called him Dave. And as my father became a grandfather to more kids, all of us who were his kids, we seemed to have a different relationship with him as well. So it seemed to be fitting that Dad was becoming Dave. My own relationship with him was, was complicated by the fact that we both did things over the years to disappoint the other person. We both hurt each other. We both made each other angry. And we never worked out a reliable way to resolve those differences. If you want to understand what I'm trying to say, I should tell you I cannot listen to Harry Chapin singing Cats in the Cradle without at least starting to cry. Now, my dad and I were always speaking to each other, but not always talking. I do know this for sure. 
he was much better than I was at letting the past go, at getting over any hurt. I know that for a fact. That takes a maturity that he always had more of than I ever did. When I was in the hospital in Memphis during the last few days of his life, uh, I was alone with him for a while, and I took his hand. I told him that I should have forgiven him more, and I should have asked for forgiveness more. Both of those things I told him were hard for me, and I told him I'd miss him. My father, by um, physical standards, was not really a very big person, but he always seemed big to me, and maybe that's how you see people you look up to. Now, I've been told by a reliable source that when I was a toddler, I would crawl over to the front door and cry until I came home from work. So maybe the problem with relationships with parents later on in life is that you spend so many years thinking that they're almost a superhero that you don't know how to handle the flaws in them once you cannot ignore those flaws anymore. Once when my son was about five years old, we were watching some amateur fireworks while sitting on a lawn. One rocket flew our way. Matthew jumped out of fear. I asked him if he wanted to go to watch from inside the porch. He said yes. So we took cover. I told him it was okay to be scared sometimes. And I was a little scared by those amateur fireworks. Well, he grabbed both my cheeks. He stared me right in the eyes. And he said, Dad, you can't be scared. You're the dad. But of course, every father, my father, and every other parent in the world is only human. They've got their good and their bad. We're all a very complicated mix of good and bad. Now, at times, the bad can seem really bad, but it doesn't change the good things about them. I know my mother would probably have a lot to say about him as a husband for 50 years. Now, a lot might seem pretty bad. But the students and teachers he worked with for over 30 years would have a lot to say, too, and so much of it would sound really good. We're all complicated. We're all things we hold tight and we keep a secret. For my father, one of those things that he uh, most kept a secret was his finances and his decisions, even from my mother. Over the years, my mother worked full-time, but only for stretches of time. She had no retirement savings or pension from her work. Now, she knew enough people who had a career for the school system, like my father did, to know that usually when a spouse dies, the person they've left can expect to keep getting the pension, but only half of it. That's the usual. It was only after my father died that my mother found out that there was no more pension, that they had been getting a good pension for many years, and now it was over because of a decision he'd made but never told her about. She couldn't really believe it when they told her over the phone there was no more pension. She went through all the papers at home, finally found the form that he had signed back in 1986, and there it was, typed in a box on the form, no beneficiary. That's a pretty low moment after 50 years of marriage. But we're all complicated because we're all people. We're human. We hurt each other at times comfort each other at other times. And I don't think it's ever easy doing the math for the good and the bad. And when someone you love dies, you shouldn't do the math. You can only hold dear the good and let the bad fade away. Even when someone's still alive, it's really not about trying to measure the good and the bad and weigh them against each other. Both are there. One thing I noticed in my reaction to my father's death is that it seemed so different from my brother Chris, my youngest brother died in a car accident when he was 17. I was 24 then, and then 24 years later, my father died. And when my brother died, I remember feeling an overwhelming but, but vague sadness, a painful sadness, because I was dealing with losing a brother and having to confront death, and I didn't really know how to do that. And I, and I, I know my pain was not the worst that was being felt then, uh, because there's nothing, I think, more painful than when a parent loses a child, like both my parents did more than 24 years ago. If there's a natural order in the universe, parents should be able to die peacefully, surrounded by their family and children, saying goodbye. When I first heard that my father was in the hospital in Memphis, where he was doing consulting work, and I realized there was a strong chance that he wouldn't recover, I felt the overwhelming sadness I remembered from my brother's death. But it seemed less vague. I think I see death differently. Part of it is I found out when I was 45 years old that I had cancer. Now, I had the surgery, I had the treatments, and here I am. And you can't help but feel like getting a diagnosis of cancer means death, at least at first. And I still feel like I'm way too young to have it over. But I remember thinking that even though getting cancer at 45 might be very unlucky, 
in my case in my life, I feel incredibly lucky to have the son that I have. He's such an amazing person. Just watching him change and grow means I think I've had the luck of 10 lifetimes. So in my own life, I can't do the math, the math of whether I should feel lucky or unlucky from cancer. I just have to hold on to what makes me feel lucky. As people get older, I think we all see death differently than when we were young. We were in Memphis, my family and I, for a few days while they did more tests. And they kept him as comfortable as they could. He was only still going because of the ventilator. We decided after all the tests had left us without any hope that we could ask him to remove the life support. And then we would be there for him. Maybe with some denial on my part during the last few days. But I had brought him a, a, a coffee from Dunkin' Donuts, his favorite, and left it by his bedside, even though I knew he couldn't drink it. And I'd brought over his Red Sox hat from his hotel room because I thought he would want to wear it. But then, as I realized this was the end, bringing the hat over him to wear seemed wrong or disrespectful. It didn't seem serious enough. And when it came to the end and the nurse removed the ventilator, we all stood around his bed. For the last few days before that, the expression on his face had never changed. His eyes never seemed focused. But just as the nurse was giving him some morphine through the IV, his face tightened, his eyes shut tight. He seemed to be crying and his body seemed to tighten, but then relaxed. The breathing slowed. Now some people say that your whole life up to that point flashes before your eyes at the time of death, but I don't think that's right. If he was feeling a painful sadness at that moment, my father was seeing the life he should have been able to still live. The time with the grandkids, the time to watch them change and grow. That is an overwhelming sadness, but there's nothing vague about it. I mentioned that I felt a little embarrassed for bringing over Red Sox hat for him to wear as he was lying in the hospital, but being a Red Sox fan really did define him. He was happy to have that be what defined him for so many people. Many years ago, my father and my mother would describe our family this way. We're uh, Irish, Catholic, and Red Sox fans, but not necessarily in that order. As you can see, you have to work from a longer list to describe my father and to understand his life. But I've always thought of my father was a particularly distinctive Red Sox fan. I know the world is full of diehard Red Sox fans. My father stood out. The fact that my brother Tim is the author of a book about Fenway Park only shows that life is not random. Back in the 1980s, my father was at a game at Fenway Park. The NBC TV crew was doing a story about old ballparks, and they had 35,000 fans to pick from for an interview. But it was my father they picked for the TV show. Who else? My father always called that the time he appeared on the Today Show with Red Sox slugger Jim Rice, because the only player they interviewed for that TV show was Jim Rice. My father had another moment of TV glory. He got on the late show with David Letterman. Letterman was doing his brush with celebrity bit with audience members, and he picked my father. And my father managed to get a big laugh out of Letterman. In some ways, being on TV to offer that comment at Fenway Park was probably his favorite TV moment. In 1972, my father managed to get only four tickets to see the Red Sox play in Baltimore. So my father, my mother, my brother Larry, and I went down to Baltimore. Now, by design we stayed in the same hotel as the Red Sox. They won the first game on a Friday night. As we rolled the elevator up to the hotel, it stopped. Tom Yawkey got on the elevator. Tom Yawkey's the guy who had owned the Red Sox since 1933. And none of us but my father recognized him. Here's what most diehard Red Sox fans would do in that situation. They would recognize Tom Yawkey. Then later, when they got off the elevator, they'd say, hey, did you see who that was on the elevator? Tom Yawkey. But see, that's not what my father did. Or maybe a normal diehard Red Sox fan has the guts to say, Mr. Yawkey, I'm a big fan. You're doing a great job. That's all my father did. <laughs> Instead, my father turned to Tom Yawkey and said very casually, I think they played very well tonight. It was as if, for the time it took us to ride that elevator, my father was the co-owner of the team. And Tom Yawkey seemed to go along with that. He turned to my father and said, yes, I think they did. The elevator got to our floor. My father and Tom Yawkey said goodnight to each other. And as we walked off, because he was wearing a Red Sox jacket, my brother Larry got a pat on the back from Tom Yawkey. My father was definitely a special Red Sox fan. 
The last thing he mailed to me before he died was baseball, signed by Jim Lomborg to my son Matthew. Dave, my father, had gone to a dinner with my brother Tim, and Jim Lomborg was a speaker. My dad met Jim Lomborg and got this ball signed for Matthew. So there were a lot of Red Sox fans in the world. None were like my father. If I try to make sense of my father's death, I cannot really, but he had so much more to do. And the only part that seems fitting in all this, this only part, is that he passed away on Memorial Day, a day that we honor service. For many years after his time in the Navy, my father would always say, this is a trick I learned in the Navy, right before he showed us how to do something. I think a big reason why I looked up to him was that my father worked so hard at everything. He always gave more of himself than he had. Whatever needed to be done, he did it. He never quit until it was done. When he started out teaching, he still worked a 40-hour week, uh, nights and weekends, year-round, at the Winchester factory in New Haven in the security office. One of my memories from childhood is my mother getting all of us kids to be quiet just so dad could sleep at odd hours because of all that work he had to do. He needed it. As the years went on and my father started having health problems, my mother knew he needed to take it easy more often. She would do her best to protect him. If I was over at their house, she'd say, here, do this before your father gets home. He, he shouldn't be climbing up ladders like that. One of the few passages in the Bible that I know is, by your works, you shall know them. By his incredibly hard work, you knew my father. My father did all of this hard work, all this hard work throughout his life with a consistently upbeat and positive attitude. If you were at a school where he was a teacher or a principal, if you asked my father how he was, you only got one answer. Fantastic. And if you asked him if something would work out, he would say, absolutely, positively. Even when he had reason to, my father rarely complained about anything. Uh, it was about 16 years ago. He had heart surgery in New Haven. He was in the ICU for a while, and it wasn't a room. It was just a space surrounded by machines. He was hooked up to tubes. He couldn't get the Red Sox game on the TV. And he must have felt somewhat unlucky at being so young and needing heart surgery. So he had lots of good reasons to gripe about his situation, but he didn't. I came to visit, and he picked up the pillow next to him, and he said, Hey, Mikey, see this pillow? It cost $2,000. That was as close to complaining as he got. I think all that positive thinking might have driven my mother crazy at times. She must have thought sometimes, but you're ignoring the reality of the situation. It didn't matter. That was how my father was. He had a long career in education, and as he got promoted, the job titles would change and the responsibilities changed. But throughout it all, I think, he saw himself as a teacher. After he retired, he went into consulting. He was so good at it that he could have succeeded at any kind of computer consulting. But I think it had to be an educational software like it was. He was incredibly proud, for example, that my sister Tricia eventually decided to become a teacher and has been so good at it. Now, my father was a teacher who enjoyed, who loved being Mr. Shea to all those students. He wanted to do whatever he could for them. He started up field trips. He organized movies, dances. He went all out. When the arc of his career in West Haven came full circle, he was back at Bailey as the principal. That's where he started out as a teacher. At the time, I was working in New York City. Now, one day, this is a week later in the school year, I met him for lunch. It was kind of a surprise. I asked him, well, why is he in the city? And he said it was a field trip for the seventh graders. And I said, oh, is this the whole seventh grade? He said, no, no, no. It's just the kids that never get to do anything, like go on trips. They aren't on the sports teams. They aren't on anything like that. Now, in most schools, kids like that are never noticed. But not in my father's school. He knew who they were. He did something for them. As a teacher and a principal, my father wanted to do as much as he could for every kid in the school. He once told me that his ideal for a school was where kids of all kinds were students, and they learned from each other and became better people. When my own father was growing up, he moved around a lot. Well, several places. He attended several different schools. So he often had to be the new kid, trying to fit in. Now, a lot of people like that um, grow up and have a natural empathy for kids who are outsiders. But that's not my father. He took his childhood experience and developed empathy for all kids, every one of them. I realized that as the thousands of students 
whose lives were touched by my father. As they've gone through life, some of them may have forgotten his name or even who he was. But I'm sure that whenever any of them feel inspired to work hard on a project or whenever any of them find the strength to stay upbeat and positive in tough times or whenever any of them step up and help out kids who need help, I'm sure they all should be thanking my father for inspiring them, for leading by example. Somewhere in their subconscious, a voice should be saying, thank you, Mr. Shea. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said that a great teacher is not the man who supplies the most facts, but the one whose presence we become different people. As a teacher, that's what my father did. The students and the teachers around him became different people. They became better people. I think the really funny thing is this. My father worked incredibly hard at things. He always gave more than he had. He was a role model for so many students and teachers. And yet, in some ways, he was always a big kid at heart. Anyway, one strong memory from my teenage years is the night when I was with my three brothers and my father. We were down at the Brantford High School baseball field, and we played until past dark. We would play as long as you could still see a fly ball against the dark blue twilight. So we sat around in the parking lot in the darkness. We brought a two-liter bottle of root beer to share. We were passing it around and chugging from the bottle. And a game quickly developed that you'd wait till the person with the bottle was in full drink mode. Then you would burp really loudly, make them laugh, and spit out the soda. These are kids acting like kids. Except the loudest burps and loudest laughs were from my, from my father that night. Part of him was always a big kid. That may have been the reason why he wanted to be called Dave by his grandkids. Part of him was always a big kid. His seventh grade math students in 1963 Remember, my father arm wrestling all the kids in class. There's a plaque in my parents' kitchen that says, If I knew grandchildren were this much fun, I'd have had them first. Now, the author of that quote is anonymous, but my father deserves to take credit for it. All his grandkids could never find a bigger cheerleader than Grandpa Dave. And I hope all his grandkids always remember this. As they grow through life, as they reach milestones, or do things with an audience, a graduation, a ball game, a school play. There should always be an empty chair because wherever my father is now, he would do anything he could to be there and cheer each of them on. Loving his grandchildren was the one part of his life that he did not have to work hard at. It came easy for him. He never ran out of love. Good night. Thank you.